We'll be out of 2 Corinthians soon. And uh, uh, just saying this for the benefit of the people online, uh, thinking about possibly going into Galatians and doing a study there. Or uh, if you have uh, something that you would like to, for us to study out during our Sunday school time, uh, get with me and let me know what a suggestion would be. Uh, I'll tell you what I think I'm going to do. Uh, I thought about this for Sunday school, but I think I want to do this on Sunday night. I would like to do a, a study of the book of Genesis on Sunday night. Deal with creation, uh, deal with uh, really the foundations of uh, Genesis is the foundation of everything. It's the beginning, it's the beginning of God's creation, the beginning of God's work. Uh, it really displays for us the very nature of God in the book of Genesis. And um, so I'm thinking seriously about uh, beginning that uh, on Sunday night. So if uh, in the next couple of weeks uh, you have an idea of where you would like to go for Sunday school, uh, just get with me and let me know. Uh, but for now, 2 Corinthians 12. And um, it's good to be back. It really is. And appreciate um, all of you that uh, supported your church while we were gone. Appreciate Brother Mike Hutzel. Uh, you pray for him. He's beginning uh, this morning his new uh, pastorate there at Oak Lane Church in uh, Harrison, Arkansas. Today would be his first official Sunday there. And I appreciate him... Um, you know, putting putting that off until he fulfilled our date here. And um, Mike is a good friend of ours, a good friend of our church, and I appreciate him and his ministry. So continue to pray for him. Uh, also want to mention that I appreciate the testimonies that were sent to me. Um, before we left for Fargo, We uh, I had mentioned uh, during Pastor Mike Online about things that people have seen that they can't explain. And I believe with all my heart that we live in a supernatural world. A, it's easy for us to say, I believe in trees, because there's trees. And it's easy for us to say, I believe in the sunlight and the moonlight, because we see them every day. But to say that you believe in spirits, Devils, ghosts, uh, things like that. Uh, people don't talk about that much, especially if they have a strange encounter. And so I brought it up before we left that if anybody ever had some sort of strange thing that you saw that you cannot explain, uh, to send it to uh, one of my email addresses. And in 24 hours, I was amazed at how much came in. And so I read what I had in 24 hours time. And I put that, posted that online the day before we left. Well, I had Courtney um, last Thursday look at that email address a week after uh, I had mentioned that. And I said, take those testimonies and copy them into a word document and uh, she said well there's it doesn't look like there's much here and I said well okay well I got the documents 35 pages long of story after story of story of people seeing things and I believe that there are times when people see spirits good and or bad uh, we're told to be careful to entertain strangers for you might be entertaining angels unaware. I, I think there was a time when we did that here. Maybe more than once when we did that. Uh, sometimes I want to pull over and pick somebody up and give them a ride. Because you never know. But you never know. And so if, if I've got my family in my car, that's probably not going to happen. But anyway, I appreciate everybody that sent that in. And um, I will probably put up another website I put up websites and uh, maybe 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 a book will come out of this because people have seen I at Pastor Cooley's church in um, uh, Minnesota I had two people tell me 
probably some of the creepiest things I've ever heard in my life. And these were born-again Christians. And I'm just going, whoa. I believe them. I believe them. Uh, There's a certain amount of verification that I did with, with one of them. And it turns out that at the time they saw something, other people in the same area and at the same time had seen nearly the same thing. So I believe you. So anyway, I appreciate that. Uh, 2 Corinthians 12, verse 14. Paul says, Behold, the third time I am ready to come to you. I will not be burdensome to you, for I seek not yours, but you. And you think about the nature of Paul and his office as apostle. Um, my role as pastor. Um, or anybody who is in the ministry. There's two types of people in ministry. The type of people who are there to serve others. And there are those who are in ministry to have others serve them. Okay? Uh, there are people in quote-unquote ministry who are all about what everybody can do for them and how they can serve them. Hand over large sums of money. Buy me a new car. Buy me a new house. Uh, give me a nice retirement plan. Or buy me a new private jet or whatever. And um, you can always really tell. There's, there's been people that I highly, I think highly of them. And I don't agree with a lot of their doctrine. doctrine but I know them. And Larry Rice is one of them. Uh, and I've met him and I've known him over the years. And he operated Channel 24 here if, in the St. Louis area. If you know that, it goes all the way back to the early 80s. And I could, you could look at the suits that Larry Rice wore and know that he was not in the ministry for the money. Okay? Because he wore some of the tackiest suits I've ever seen anybody in my life. And so, and it, you could, it, it was almost like he had a giveaway place where people gave away old clothes and he wore them. So, but I, I had a chance to meet him. And there's a lot of things that I would not agree with with Larry Rice, but he was not in it for people to serve him. You could tell he was in it to serve the community. And I, so I appreciated that. And that's what Paul is saying here. He said, uh, I seek not yours, but you. Paul was in this thing for the benefit of others, not so that others would benefit him. And he said, for the children ought not lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children. And he's saying a truth that even lost people know this. Lost people see that, see life this way. It is the parents that go out and support the children. And even if those children, once they're out on their own and doing their own thing, when mom and dad, uh, is gone on, then that inheritance thing goes to the children. The parents lay it for the children. That's how Paul sees himself here. He's telling the church, you're my child. I've birthed you. I've travailed in you. And um, so he said, it's not your responsibility to lay up for me. It's my responsibility to lay up for you. And he says, I will very gladly spend and be spent for you. Though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. You ponder that. Because there's always somebody that you love in an unconditional manner that does not respond likewise. It's always going to be somebody like that. And you're, the more you love them, the more you have to tell them the truth. And because of that, and Paul said in one place, it might now become your enemy because I speak the truth. And that's, you know, that's the nature of it, is that we have in this time that we live in so many people who do not want the truth, they do not have a love for the truth that they might be saved. So God turns them over to reprobate mind and God lets them be lied to and they hate the people that speak the truth. They hate them. Um, verse 16, but be it so, I did not burden you. Nevertheless, being crafty, I caught you with guile. Did I make gain of you by any of them whom I sent unto you? And this, you have to understand, we know by scripture that Paul wrote a total of four letters 
to this church. We have two of them in our Bible. And you say, well, what happened to the other two? Why aren't they in our Bible? They were written by Paul. Obviously, God did not see the need of putting those books in our scriptures. It may be that it was Paul saying what he has already said in so many other places. I don't know. We don't know the answer to that. But every time Paul sends uh, somebody to this church to carry a letter from him, he reminds them. When, they, when I sent them there, I didn't send them there with an empty sack for you to fill up so I can live high on the hog. I sent them there for your benefit. So I desired, verse 18, I desired Titus and with him I sent a brother. Did Titus make a gain of you? Did Titus come and get all your money from you? Uh, walked we not in the same spirit? Walked we not in the same steps? Again, thank ye that we excuse ourselves unto you. We speak before God in Christ, but we do all things dearly beloved for your edifying. And he says two, two things can judge me and my, my actions and what my intentions are. I speak in front of God. In other words, God is my judge. God knows my heart. God knows everything that I'm saying to you. And you also can judge me and what you think my motives are. And my motives are pure. My motives are right. So he says, verse 20, but I fear lest when I come, I shall not find you such as I would and that I shall be found unto you such as ye would not, lest there be debates. And we're going to get into these very quickly. Debates, envyings, wrath, strife, backbitings, whispering, swellings, tumults. And lest when I come again, my God will humble me among you and that I shall bewail many which have sinned already and have not repented of the uncleanness and fornication and lasciviousness which they have committed. Uh, going back to verse 20, Paul said, For I fear lest when I come, I shall not find you as such as I would, and that I shall be found unto you such as ye would not. Uh, hold your place there in 2 Corinthians 12 and turn to 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. I preached this not too long ago, several Sundays ago, about uh, a man that used to go to our church. And, you know, understand that I've been here in this, in this very room. I've been here for the majority of my life since I was at least eight years old. I've seen a lot of people come in. I've seen a lot of people go out. I've seen them come in and understand that when I was a boy, I mean, I idolized these men in this church. I looked up to them. Some of them were my Sunday school teachers and I had them in the highest regard. And I'll never forget, there was a man that was my Sunday school teacher and you just, you just count on these people being faithful. Well, he was, I remember one particular Sunday, the preacher said, all of you who are, stand ready to uh, serve Jesus all your life and you're ready to go to heaven or whatever, raise your hand, say amen. And of course, people all over the room raising their hand, say amen. And I just happened to glance at this man and he was standing, he was standing there at the back ready to take up the offering. And he never budged, didn't say amen, didn't raise his hand. And his face was just expressionless. And that puzzled me and I'm going, what's the matter with him? Why did he not answer that? And it wasn't just a few weeks after that, that that was the last time I ever saw him. And what happened was he went out back to his old lifestyle, drinking, monkeying around with women and left his wife, left his children so he could go back to the old ways. And as far as I know to this day, he's in the same condition or worse. So I've seen these people come in. I've seen them hang around for a while. I've seen them get involved and then out the door they go. And Paul here, he's, he goes around establishing churches. And while he's there, 
he makes sure that what they're hearing comes from God. He makes sure of that. But then his, his calling is a church planner. And once he's established that church and he sets a bishop to rule over that church and to uh, preach over that church, he leaves and goes to start another church. And then he starts hearing now then when he's gone, how the wolves have come in. And he said that near the end of the book of Acts. He said, I know that after my departing, grievous wolves shall enter in. And sure enough, that's what they did at the church of Corinth. And so Paul now understands that just because they started out good, that doesn't necessarily mean that they'll end up that way. So in 2 Peter chapter 2, um, if you look at verse 20, for if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. Be better if they had never heard the gospel. Now, I don't quite understand how that is better because, and some would say, maybe they don't go to hell. Uh, the wicked shall be turned in hell and all the nations that forget God. So uh, Romans chapter 1 tells us clearly that everybody is without excuse. But I've seen in people's lives how after they come in and play church for a while and they depart, then... It is worse. And the, the sins that they, that they get into after that are far worse than they ever were before. And with one guy in particular, it killed him. His sins killed him. It crippled his body. And Satan took everything from this guy's life. And at the end, he took his life. And so in verse 22, But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog is returned to his own vomit again. And you let that dog lick you on the face. What were you thinking? And the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. My choir teacher, my vocal teacher when I was in high school, uh, Mr. Dennis Nall used to have a, a, a saying on his office window that said, Never try to teach a pig to sing. It wastes your time and it annoys the pig. And there's a lot of wisdom in that. That right here, when you wash a pig, put a pearl necklace around her neck, nice pretty lipstick, it's still a pig. And it's going to go back to the old ways very quickly. It's not going to take long either. So that's, a lot of what happens when you're in the ministry. You kind of get used to it. You kind of get used to putting all your labor, your efforts into people, sowing seed in them, trying to water that seed. Paul said, I have sown the seed, Apollos waters, but God brings the increase. So we know that whatever happens, that's entirely up to God. But... It can get pretty frustrating when you work and labor among people and with people and then you see that just go to waste in their life. And I'm probably not the only minister in the world that's ever thought of, why don't I just pastor a virtual internet church so I don't have to deal with people? But it's, I, I'm in the job of dealing with people. Uh, doctors. Doctors are trying to save people's lives. And so the doctor has the right to tell you you're overweight, you're smoking too much, you're drinking too much, you have a terrible lifestyle. They have, they, they have that responsibility to tell you that. But I can understand how some doctors just quit caring whether or not people actually change or not. Because they know for the most part they're going to put all their skills and all their talents into helping these people. They're going to go right back out and do the same thing all over again. So that's, you know, that's always in the mind and the heart of any, anybody in the ministry 
is that failure is part of it. It's just part of it. It's the way things go. You work and you labor and you sow and you try to build people's lives up and you do everything you can for them. And sometimes every now and then it pays off. But with a lot of people, it never does. So now, Paul has a warning here against discord. And he says it in verse 20. And what he's worried about is, lest I, when I come, I shall not find you as I would. In other words, I would like to be able to see that when I come back to you, you're better than even when I left. But he said, I think probably there are things going on in those people's lives. Number one, debates. Debates. There are people, you may very well be one of them, that no matter what anybody says, you're going to argue with them. And, you know, friendships and relationships, husband and wife, parents to children, children to parents, friend to friend, brother to brother, Christian to Christian, friendships are based upon listening and talking. But some people just want to talk. And they'll overtalk you. They'll cut you off. No matter what you say, no matter how you say it, they're going to argue. And it's like they cannot keep their mouth shut. It's always a debate. I've been challenged by many people. One guy in particular. He didn't like what I said about, you know, I, I kind of teach against some of this dispensationalism stuff because it's plainly not of the scriptures. And I had a guy write me an email and he challenged me. He said, I dare you. He said, you, you bring me into Festus and let me come in there with, in that room with you, give me a microphone and let's, let's debate this online in front of everybody. And I'm going, why in the world would I do that? In other words, why would I buy this guy a plane ticket or a bus ticket or pay his gas or whatever for him to come in and sit and try to make a fool out of me in my program? Why would I do that? And so I don't like debating. Now I say some things that I think are right. You may not agree. And if you don't agree... There's ways to handle it. You can either say, you know what, it's not a big deal with me. If that's the way he wants to believe. That's fine, whatever. Uh, or you could say, God, I think pastor's really wrong on this. God, would you teach him the error? You can do that. And there's been many things that I've changed my mind about. Theologically, doctrinally. Um, or you could just try to debate me every time I open my mouth. You could try to get involved and try to cut me off. And that's how some people are. And what does that do? I mean, in a presidential debate, most people already have their mind made up. Because if we get, a candid if we get candidates, generally they are miles apart on their philosophical ideas and their ideologies, or they wouldn't be running against each other. So with me, I don't need them to debate. I already know what I stand for, what I believe in. And if this person stands for what I stand for, I'm going to vote for them. Doesn't matter what party they're in, I'm going to vote for them. But some people always want to debate and they always want to get into the argument. And it's uh, debating usually is the sin of pride. Because it says... I'm right on everything and everybody else. I mean, I am God's gift to humanity because God sent me to this world so that everybody could be straightened out by what I say. And that's how some people are. If you're that way, ask God to break you. Because at the very least, you're annoying. But at its worst, you're dangerous. You're so full of pride 
that you cannot be corrected by anybody, including God. Including God. Debates. Envyings. Envyings. People who are jealous about somebody else being in a good mood. Jealous about somebody else getting something. Jealous about somebody else having their prayers answered. Jealous about somebody else receiving joy from God. Or a gift from God. And you're jealous and envious of them. And now you're mad at them. Why? Why are you mad at them? Because God gave them something that God didn't give you. And now you're like a little three-year-old. Who daddy gave candy to brother but he didn't give me no candy and there are some people who spend their entire life envious and hating everybody else around them because they think they always get the short end of the stick and stuff like that destroys relationships it'll destroy a marriage it'll destroy uh, debates and envies it'll destroy a church it'll destroy Family relationships, sibling relationships, it'll destroy everything. En envying is one of the things tearing this country apart. Now, America is supposed to be this place where if you're innovative or you have an idea that no one else had or you work harder than everybody else has worked, then America is a place where that can be rewarded and rewarded very well. How many people in this country have struck it rich who didn't come from a wealthy family, who didn't have a silver spoon handed to them, who didn't go to Harvard University, who weren't given daddy's money over to them? How many people in this country rose up from nothing and became great people because they worked hard or they were, they were innovative in some way. Somebody did something and they figured out a better way to do it. And what happens is in this country, you have envying. You have poor people who hate wealthy people. And for no other reason than they're not wealthy. And in some cases... They're not either not smart enough to be wealthy or they're not innovative enough to be wealthy or they didn't work hard enough to be wealthy. Or people have, they think that people get something and that means that has to be taken away from somebody else. And there's, and I tell you what, there's enough people in this country, black, white, Hispanic, religious this, religious that, that they are stirring up class envy in this country. Why? How much are you making a year? Well, did you know that your boss makes three times that amount? Yeah, but he's probably got four times the responsibility. He probably works hours at the end of the day that I don't work. But they stir up this envy against other people to try to get you to hate everybody else. And that's, listen, socialism, the fertilizer of socialism is envy. What gives socialism to grow in a country is envy. How did, how did Russia go from having a, a kingdom, a czar over them, to a communist dictatorship? They stirred up the workers against the oligarchs, the rich people, and the rich politicians, and the king. They stirred up the people with class envy. And so they think the solution to that is... To make everybody equal. Pay everybody the same wage, whether they work harder or don't work harder. Pay everybody the same wage. Everybody makes the same amount of money. And if you listen very carefully to the rhetoric that's coming out of, the, out of your TV sets and your radio stations in this country, it is class envy. It is getting people to be hate, hateful and envious of other people. It's getting the have, have nots to hate the haves. And then they say, here's the solution. If everybody makes the same amount of money, then we'll all fix all of our problems. And it's a joke. It doesn't work. It's never worked. It didn't work in Russia. It hasn't worked in China. It hasn't worked in North Korea. It hasn't worked in Cuba. And it won't work in the United States of America. It's not, how's that working in Venezuela? It's not. 
Adolf Hitler was able to... What did I do? Adolf Hitler was able to take power in Germany because he stirred up envy against the Jews. And he was able to actually pass a law saying every Jew... Is it time already? Every Jew had to register and we're going to come in, take away their businesses, take away their money. We're going to take everything from them. And it was basically stirred it up against them. Envies, wraths. Um, wrath is you thinking that everybody ought to get everything that you think they deserve. That's wrath. You didn't. You didn't get what you had coming. You've not gotten what you deserved. Well, they did this. So what? You did that. Okay? And I don't have time to get into the rest of this, but these are things that will absolutely destroy relationships. Families. I'm going to preach on the family this morning. Families, church families, a nation, all of these things are destroyers. They sow discord among brethren. And I've got it in my mind that most of the people in this country want to get along. Now, that doesn't mean that we have to accept everything there is to accept about them. It doesn't mean we have to agree with them on everything. It doesn't mean we have to like everything they do or say. But I think for the most part, most people in this country just want to get along, go about their lives and not be caught up in fights and tumults and everything else. But you have people in this country that love stirring it up and that's how they get their power. And we, we could do without them in America. Amen. And you could do without them in a church too. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the word that was given to us this morning. Father, I pray, dear God, that the word would increase in our hearts. And Father, help us and teach us. Help us, dear God, to not be these things. If somebody that is listening to me today has an issue with any of these, Lord, that I've mentioned, the ones that are in your word. And God, I pray, Lord, that you would help them. Because they need help. And they need a lot of it. Because, Lord, everything that they get involved in, they destroy. They've destroyed multiple relationships they've destroyed church relationships they've destroyed family relationships and it's destroying our country so father i pray dear god that you would convict us so that we would be better tomorrow than what we are today thank you lord for the engrafted word lord teach us and change us and make us better we pray in jesus name all of god's people said amen